Okay, so here we are on overheads one, and I'm starting the into the notes. Um, you know, if you remember from 706, this uh, uh, the 706 notes um, uh, out of the uh, imaging the Earth's interior part of the class ended, you know, at just over uh, just about uh, page uh, 150 uh, in the upper right corner there. And so here we are at 160. And this now goes into the more advanced material that I put into 757. So um, I want you to consider this, uh, this cross section here with a diagram of a seismic survey on the top with the asterisks for the, uh, for the shots. And uh, oh, gee, OK. Um, and, the, um, and the inverted triangles for the um, um, Travis. For the receivers. Okay, good. Um, hey, uh, no, that's what I want. Okay, now I can go to read mode. All right, so we're in. Uh, we're in um, uh, number one, uh, PDF number one, and. Um, just a little higher. Okay. I love that. Uh, no, we don't want that thing yeah. falling on the ground. That's Here. okay. You want to put it on something? I'm not right. Okay. Okay. So the uh, the asterisks are the uh, are the shots. The inverted triangles are the receivers. Geophones G. Uh, the shots are at their own. Notice that they're all along the x-axis. So you could talk about um, x sub s, which would be a, a shot location, or just s. X sub g, which would be a, a geophone location. You know, we're only dealing with 2D here in a one-dimensional survey, line survey. You can also talk about x sub m, which is the x coordinate of the midpoint. Okay. For and you'll note that uh, this particular survey has been very cleverly set up. Uh, that to be an expanding spread, so that uh, uh, all of the um, uh, all of the shots and receivers have the same midpoint. You know, you shoot uh, this one into the close receiver. You shoot the middle shot into the middle receiver. You shoot the distant shot into the distant receiver. So they're all organized already on the ground to be uh, uh, around the same midpoint. The um, the offset between the source and receiver is thus uh, 2h. Um, H is for half offset. And uh, what we have done here is we start with uh, h equals 0, and we expand out to h equal to, uh, you know, and I'm sure you're familiar in most surveys, uh, you might go to h equal to the depth z of your objective, of your uh, target, or, or uh, 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 if you're uh, having to try really hard, uh, larger than the target, than the depth of the target. Uh, of course, um, when you have lateral velocity variation, when your velocity v is not constant in the section or between the surface and the uh, and the reflector, uh, but is a, uh, the velocity varies as a function of x and z. And uh, remember from 706 that we're still holding to the uh, assumption here that we have linear uh, elastic waves. So velocity is not going to vary as a function of time. Okay? If you look at earthquake strong ground motion, and like the uh, University of Texas at Austin facility, um, where they have the uh, liquidator that shakes the ground hard enough that uh, they can cause liquefaction in the right setting uh, around the vibrator pad, um, you know, that's a situation where, where the Intrinsic uh, ground uh, velocity property, among others, um, can vary with time, and we are not discussing that uh, in seismic surveying. Uh, we always assume that uh, velocity is constant with time. But now we're going to start. Uh, if you remember from 706, how we were building up this this train of of different assumptions that we began with velocity being constant in time, uh, but also constant in in uh, in location and depth, um, now we're going to start to violate that. So we have lateral velocity variation. Uh, in 706, we had uh, covered already uh, the fact that we're going to allow our reflectivity to vary 
uh, any any way we like over the uh, the section. So reflectivity r is going to be a function of uh, of uh, our uh, our distance axis x and uh, our depth z. Um, and uh, we're going to consider the same reflectivity that we considered in in um, uh, in 706, where you know the reflectivity is zero almost everywhere, uh, but you know along um, formation boundaries and faults will the the reflectivity will will be spike like and and increase to uh, to the reflection coefficient, um, and we talked about a lot of that in uh, um, in 706. All right, so now of course real experiments are run with one source recorded by, um, well, it's been a long time since I used a 12-channel array uh, for reflection experiments, usually at least 24 these days for you know, small-scale academic stuff with a couple of students. Uh, and nowadays, the uh, number of receivers uh, monitoring one source goes up uh, very easily to over 20,000. I don't know what's the what's the uh, the most uh, receivers recorded by one shot that uh, you guys ever uh, ever encountered um, in, a, in a you know like in a three D survey. Are, are you encountering much more than twenty thousand these days? We don't really deal with survey. Well, I didn't really deal with surveys in that way. We I got a large merged data set and a bunch of different surveys all merged into one. Right. Right. So. So some of them were probably older and uh, and had fewer receivers per shot gather, and some of them were probably much larger, and and newer. It was in the hundreds of thousands. Surveillance of of simultaneously recorded receivers. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I need to add two. I need to add two zeros to this uh, to this uh, uh, 2048. <laughs> Um, that's impressive. Let's see, it was a 28 million square kilometer grid. Right. So. Right, right, right. Or square meter. But they, but they were, they were all, they were all recorded simultaneously. Yeah. Wow. How long was the stream running? It was 7,000 meter, or... Let's see, seven kilometers. Twenty-seven thousand, twenty-seven thousand feet in line, and uh, four point two kilometers across line. Uh, How many boats did it take to tow that? I, I didn't know about the boats. You asked me that. I didn't oh, know. right, 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 I right. Didn't know about how that that, that could be a trade there. secret for all we know, right? Well, it was a spec <coughs> survey. Oh yeah. I could probably look it up. Probably done by Western or Fugro. TGS. T yeah. TGS, yeah, they can do that. Okay, so in 706, we had considered wave fields, uh, you know, zero offset um, wave fields, where we had, uh, you know, nominally pressure, uh, pressure scalar recorded as a function of x in our 2D, in our 2D survey, and time. Okay, so there's a geophone at different values of x, and and, uh, and then uh, with time after the initiation of the source, we record the pressure at each geophone or hydrophone. Um, and now we're going to consider data sets where we have uh, the same uh, traces. Okay, There's still the idea of a seismogram. But instead of having a, a two-dimensional image like we did in 706, now we, in multi-offset work, we have a three-dimensional data volume. Um, which is um, composed, uh, and this is this three-dimensional data volume is just for uh, considering two D surveys. Okay, you go to you go to three D surveys, and you start to uh, you know broaden that definition of naturally. So so uh, you know even in our simplest you know twelve channel work uh, by uh, an engineer. Uh, you know, all by himself, uh, completing a reflection survey in one day. You know, out of the back of a pickup truck, um, he's still faced with a uh, uh, a three D data volume. Um, 
and I guess I said he because the the really good female engineers all work for the big oil companies, and you know they don't do twelve channel stuff. Um, the uh, uh, so our our dimensions on the data set are the axes of our data set are the source location, the receiver location, and then of course time down each seismogram. So there's a lot of advantages compared to what we've been doing in um, in 706 to uh, multi-offset data. Uh, and the first one is, is that you know, we, we kind of glossed over the, uh, uh, the problem in, uh, um, in 706. Where do we get our measurements of velocity from? How do we estimate velocity? You know, I talked about velocity a lot, but I didn't, I didn't show you how to measure it. Um, and, and now, here in 757, we're going to learn something about measuring velocity. Okay, in conventional ways and in, and in unconventional ways. Uh, there's also uh, the advantage of the multiplicity of data. Okay, um, stacking, as we call it, whether it's summing, uh, otherwise known as vertical stacking, or um, or uh, CDP stacking, as you have have heard about, or other kinds of stacking, um, you know, common image gather uh, stacking. Uh, stacking sums redundant data. Data that's uh, that is in some way re geometrically redundant, okay, uh, and the the reason for that summation is to increase the ratio of signal over random noise, and um, uh, so what I was trying to write was lower noise, but really what I mean is to increase the signal over noise ratio. Um, there's also many fewer assumptions. That are made. Okay, uh, just by um, uh, you know, just by recording uh, and um, uh, and and migrating 2D zero offset data only, you're making a lot of assumptions about uh, like like we did with the exploding reflector model. You're making a lot of assumptions about velocity. Uh, Varying only with z, only with depth, okay, uh, and uh, at some at at other points we had to make assumptions that dip was zero, okay, and we want to get around all those. We want to be able to vary velocity laterally, and we want to be able to vary velocity sharply laterally. Um, that is not such an issue in uh, in Texas, uh, the Gulf Coast, but in the North Sea. In the Rockies, and then in our own dear Great Basin for geothermal uh, reflection surveys, um, you know you can uh, you can move in X by 50 meters, and you can you can have two or three times the velocity. So uh, lateral velocity variation is is was the battle we had to fight uh, in um, uh, in geothermal reflection surveys in the in the Great Basin. And uh, it's a battle that uh, we have won now, um, if I do say so myself. Um, OK, now, disadvantages. Um, you know, there's at least two orders of magnitude more data. And these days, you know, if you have two orders of magnitude more data than a 12-channel uh, survey, um, that's not so bad. But uh, I'm sure you guys will like in that survey that you were talking about, Kyle. Um, how many how many terabytes or petabytes of data were there? Uh, would you hazard a guess? It was at least a terabyte. I yeah. Think with little, I would cut out cubes. And what was your, what was the cube size you were? Hundreds of gigs. Right. So your your cut down size would be hundreds of gigs. Yeah. Yeah. So so right away, uh, you know, our data sets are still. To this day, larger than what we can jam into our machine's RAM. Okay, so so we have to think about moving data around in in different ways. And I recently saw a um, a presentation um, by um, uh, uh, a scientist affiliated with uh, with NSF, you know, visualization, scientific visualization, and and uh, high performance computing efforts um, about petascale computing and data visualization. 
uh, you know, where, where everything's in petabytes and, and uh, petaflops and all that. Um, and, and one of his main conclusions was that there, you know, in, this, in this coming era of hundreds of thousands of, uh, of channels per shot and, and um, terabytes and petabytes of data, um, there is going to be nothing so hard as moving the data around. Okay, just just getting the data from RAM to the CPUs when you have petabytes and petabytes, exabytes of data, uh, that that can be your entire problem. Everything else pales in comparison. The 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 number of, of petaflops required to do the processing, um, the uh, the. The size, you know, the, the the size of the screens, uh, you know, if you're projecting on uh, what did they call that? The the circular curtain walls that uh, they use at uh, Exxon. Sorry. Viswal. Viswal, yeah. You know, I mean, maybe that's a uh, uh, a giga scale, a gigapan scale uh, image. Uh, all of that is easy compared to the simple job of moving data from RAM to CPU, and then even worse, moving data from disk to RAM. All right, um, our our uh, data speeds just cannot match the size of our data sets now, um, and that's becoming the bottleneck. Uh, and uh, if you let me know, I think that seminar was recorded, and I'd be glad to uh, uh, send the links to you guys. Um, so, so that's the problem with, with uh, more data. Um, and uh, it, it really is, um, you know, the radio astronomers were pushing it for a while. The climate modelers were pushing, um, you know, computational models and, and petaflops for a while. Um, the, uh, the earthquake scenario modelers have been pushing the petaflops for a while. But um, uh, really, it's the... Um, it's the exploration geophysicists now who are who are pushing the uh, uh, at least in industry pushing the issue of um, um, of data loading, you know, getting the data to the CPU and then out to the display. Uh, that is the huge problem right now. Uh, okay, we are going to talk also about the uh, the largely unknown and very difficult to control trade-offs between. Lateral velocity variation, v is a function of x, and dip. Okay, and you know there's also the not inconsiderable challenge that we just need more complex analysis. You know, our our simple exploding reflector model and and uh, downward continuation, which is the heart of our seismic imaging, the definition of seismic imaging, it's it's going to become about four times more complex, um, and. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, it, every bit of complexity adds to an opportunity for error and an opportunity for inconsistent data to, to blow up in our faces, an opportunity for uh, a huge opportunity for gaining uh, those execrable uh, null spaces of our models. Um, the complexity is, uh, is, is uh, uh, a big, uh, you know, theoretical and, and uh, um, uh, uh, a big theoretical problem, essentially. Hey John, what do you mean by unknown trade-offs between the x and the? Well, um, there's always some trade-off. You know, there's um, uh, you, you will, I'll, I'll lecture about this in more detail uh, in a little bit, but the. Um, um, Okay, we know theoretically exactly what the trade-off is, although you know, hearing Graham talk the other day about about uh, um, head waves and uh, and such, uh, you know, it, it's it's definitely true that um, you know just by having the if you have perfectly the arrival time of every phase in your in your data set, well. You only have you know one percent of the data in that data set. You know the waveform is where the rest of it lies. Uh, you know the waveforms and their amplitudes. Um, 
so uh, uh, you know that's a since we're so used to to using you know time data by itself that's a you know that can lead to uh, big gaps in our, our understanding but but even even if we accept if we accept that uh, that the time data describes our whole uh, our whole world um, which is how we built most of the algorithms we use these days um, we can accept that and um, uh, and then you know we have a theoretical understanding of of exactly then what the trade-off is between lateral velocity variation and the uh, uh, and dip or structure let's say so it's trade-off between velocity and structure okay and and okay that's 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 got us this perfectal that, that it's got this perfect theoretical description as long as we put on our, our blinded rose colored glasses and accept the uh, the time data is perfect all right which we have been um, but then any given data set okay even leaving aside the uh, the the our misgivings about time data um, you know arrival times um, we're not going to know how to, uh, you know, right off the bat, we're not going to know how to exercise the uh, the, the the theory of the, of these trade offs. You know, the 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 trade off takes a different uh, formulaic form depending on you know um, whether we're determining the uh, uh, the depth of a of a of a reflector that's known to be flat versus uh, you know shooting. Shooting under a uh, um, uh, the flanks of a salt dome. Okay, there's uh, uh, you know whole rafts of hypotheses that we have to consider, and we won't you know we don't we don't know we may we may you know even in this in this perfectly timed world we may still not be able to resolve different uh, you know hypotheses but and, and decide between different hypotheses of. Of how the trade-off is is formulated. Um, okay, and it, because it's so highly nonlinear, um, you know, if you if you consider um, if you consider a, a, a complex system where uh, waves are propagating through uh, uh, a, a diverse material and um, you know bending in all kinds of different directions. You know, there's all kinds of uh, triplications and and uh, uh, oh, what do they call them? Um, you know, they're really uh, caustics. caustics, yeah. And uh, you know, those are very difficult geometric concepts. Okay. Now, uh, uh, here's a here's a piece that's been uh, 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 you know exploited uh, now. Uh, uh, for very effectively for some years, multi-offset data also contain a lot more information about the nature of the material, uh, the nature of the reflectors than um, uh, than zero offset data, okay, uh, or single offset data. Uh, and and for instance, uh, um, information on how the reflection coefficient varies with incidence angle, you know, amplitude versus offset. Is uh, how it's termed AVO. That's a a very valuable uh, piece of information, and and we'll look at some some very simple early ways, uh, you know, as simple as Stolt migration, which still try to which try to you know make a summary of that uh, um, and, and capitalize on that information. Okay, and uh, then we'll we'll consider uh, AVO. Um, uh, itself uh, later on as well. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna define uh, some coordinates in the way that uh, Clairbout does. Um, you know, he's always looking for some some simple mathematical substitutions that allow him to uh, um, you know make the equations a little bit simpler in his books. And so we're gonna follow that. So um, you know, every survey knows its uh, its S's, its source locations on the x-axis. Every survey knows its G's, its receiver locations on the uh, uh, on the uh, x-axis. And as you guys have been struggling with, uh, you know, loading data into our various processing packages, 
um, you know, if you don't have that, um, you can't you can't even start. Um, and then uh, we're going to define the midpoint. And, and notice this is not the CDP. This is not the depth point. This is the midpoint. So the mid, you know, the depth point depends on structure. Uh, actually, as I had on the the previous page, notice that even though all these traces uh, have the same midpoint, and that's easy to define uh, just from their their x locations, um, the actual depth points, the reflection points, are not all the same because there's dip, right? So that's pretty obvious. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about midpoints, not depth points. Um, occasionally, I may slip and say CDP instead of CMP. Um, and I might say depth point instead of midpoint. But what I really mean, and in many surveys, all you know is the midpoint. Okay? And you also can know the offset, okay? which is the, uh, the offset is the difference between the two x's, g minus s. And, um, uh, and then uh, just like we take g plus s over 2 for the midpoint, Clairbout likes to take g minus s over 2 for the half offset. Um, and notice that uh, uh, under Clairbaut's definition, um, uh, the uh, the offset that or, or h can be uh, can be negative, and and there could be information in that, um, and you will occasionally see negative offsets um, listed in uh, uh, in segway headers. Okay, so then if we fix s and g, and we let time vary, then uh, we have a piece of our data volume, a, a, a slice, a, a, a little part of our data volume. And the way I like to write it, uh, just as in 706, is we have a pressure, measure, a pressure field p, which is at a constant s, one value of s. It's at a constant g, one value of g. But it's for any value of time. Okay? And that is one trace. That's one seismogram. Okay? So now uh, uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to concentrate on looking at the, the locations, the S and G and other coordinates of the seismograms, and not worry so much about the time. Um, you know, we're ju just, just trying to sort out the geometry here. Okay? And so um, I'm, I'm just going to consider the location coordinates of the seismograms, and I'm going to just let those those uh, those time that time axis uh, you know hang hang down in the background. All right, sorting and gathers. Um, so we we might take a number of traces and assemble them into some kind of record section or gather. All right, and this data volume is uh, the data volume is three dimensional. Three dimensional. Uh, so uh, uh, usually what we get uh, out of the field is uh, a volume of shot records, which is organized as um, uh, in this way uh, in my, my notation. Uh, the pressure measurements P as a function of uh, source X, receiver X, receiver X coordinate G, and then time. Uh, and sometimes uh, you might see, um, uh, like in these common image gathers, those are, are uh, uh, related to the um, uh, a sorted out data volume, which uh, would be sorted out in terms of uh, it's still the same p, but now the traces are located and sorted relative to their midpoint, their half offset h, and time. Okay, so um, you know to look at that three D volume more easily, we hold one of them constant. Okay, s g or t, or alternatively m h or t. And we cut it into 2D slices okay? by taking a constant s, okay, we get a constant shot gather, okay? constant shot location gather, <clears throat> uh, which has, uh, you know, for that shot location, it has all the, G, all the different geophones and then all time. Okay? That's a 2D slice or a gather. And the process of, of really slicing the data volume um, it, uh, it, into um, these different uh, uh, 2D gathers 
uh, it's often called sorting. Okay, uh, but really, it's nothing more than uh, uh, all all the sorts that you typically see are nothing more than than slices, two D slices of a three uh, D data volume. So depending on what's held constant and how the data volume gets sorted, the gathers have different names. All right. Now in 706, we worked a lot uh, with uh, the zero offset section, or or you know, and how do we get our zero offset sections? You know, I explained that it was by via the stacking process, without saying much more about what stacking really meant. But that's what we were working with, and so uh, that is our wave field P of m, h, and t. And for a um, for all midpoints, for h equal to zero, half offset equal to zero, okay, that one value of offset, and then all time. So that's a two D gather in m and t, and we talked about that uh, last time as as a gather in x and t. But now we know that the the x it was really m, okay. Uh, all right, now. Um, in, in land recording and marine recording as well, there's no such thing as a true zero offset trace. You just can't put a geophone exactly where the, the source is um, you know, without crushing it or blowing it apart. So uh, what we typically look at, if we, if we want to look at a zero offset data section, what we typically have to look at is a near trace or minimum offset section. So that's uh, you know, P of M, H, and T. But we take the constant value of h equal to the minimum value of h we have. All right, and and that just reminds us that we could take any value of h. Uh, could be uh, the minimum offset, could be the maximum offset for a far trace section, or as you may have uh, have uh, looked at a little bit, we could make a constant offset section. So h equals some constant. You know, we can we can usefully look at anything between the minimum and the maximum offset. Uh, now, what about this uh, this last one here? This is one you've probably heard about. You know, when people talk about CDP gathers, what they really mean, or at least what they really ought to mean, is the CMP gather. Okay, common midpoint gather, and that's our uh, our two D slice of the data set where we take uh, m equals constant, one value of m. Okay, as a constant. And all values of h or the offset and t. Um, so uh, you know CDP is uh, is is a widely used term. You know it kind of rattles off people's tongues uh, um, automatically, or at least it used to. I, I hope it's disappearing. I don't know if you can if you can verify that. Um, you know so operationally it's it means the same as the CMP. But it's strictly incorrect because it's only when you have you know flat layer cake geology that that the CDP equals the CMP. So hopefully uh, you know under the influence of other uh, um, you know descent, academic descendants of Clairbout, uh, the uh, CMP term is holding. Could it be almost a correct term if you have NMO and DMO and migrated data? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. You you you're yeah right and and in a common that's the idea behind a con, common image gather, you know the common image gather is actually the CDP gather. At least we hope so, as much as possible. Well, it's based on your model, right? Your your velocity model, your your uh, your the location model for your surveys, right? It's highly model dependent, but I mean everything we do is model is highly model dependent and. And and is in essence an interpretation, right? So, uh, you know that's fine. I I, uh, uh, I I would say yeah, that's that's fine. You know we could go back to calling uh, um, uh, you know SIGs. We could, we could go back to calling them CDP gathers. Okay, although it, technically I think SIGs are well SIGs are corrected, right? They're corrected for uh, um, for the uh, move out, the normal move out, the dip move out, the yeah, other yeah, move outs. Yeah. yeah. So they're uh, you know SIGs are not exactly the same as a CDP gather, but they yeah they, you could call it a um, a move out corrected uh, um, CDP gather. 
Okay. So then if you have like pre stack data and if it isn't time, you wouldn't call it a CDP, right? Because you're looking at time, not depth, or would you just make that assumption? Ah, uh, well, and then we get into the issue, you know, are we, uh, are we dealing with, um, um, you know, are we, are we going to be do, attempting uh, depth migration or are we going to be satisfied, you know, for a first cut time migration? If you're, if you're satisfied with a first cut time migration and you don't yet have that analysis of lateral velocity variation, to implement the, 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 the thin lens term at least, okay, uh, as we heard about in 706. Um, you know, so if, you, if you're not at that stage yet, then uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would just go ahead and, and, you know, use time and depth interchangeably and not worry about it, you know, because, because to really say this is the depth, to really do that depth migration, You've got to know those lateral velocity variations, um, and that that's that's a lot of work. You know, that's um, that's uh, uh, Satish and Bill's whole company. You know, at least for a while, that was their whole company. Um, and um, so uh, I'm 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 happy to uh, I'm happy to to uh, you know when you, when we're just talking time migration. Um, I'm, I'm happy to swap time and depth, no, no sweat, you know, and you got to know there's going to be certain artifacts and certain dangers to that. That's fine. Uh, okay. Other gathers that uh, you have no doubt heard of, um, take, okay. Now we've got, we're going to consider data sorted into S, G, and T, take constant S. Okay. Constant source, common shot gather. Um, uh, you know, thinking about thinking back to the time when when most of our reflection data, and this is even before my time, when most of our reflection data was uh, recorded by uh, dynamite shots, um, or well, and there's a lot of most of our data actually is still recorded by air gun shots. So it's not not a shot is not a bad term. Um, oh, maybe we should maybe we should start talking about uh, uh, CBP CB. Um, uh, um, instead of common shot gathers, we should talk about common bubble gathers because we, you know, for the marine mammal people, we need to talk about uh, uh, air guns as uh, bubblers. Okay, <laughs> it just works much better. Um, so yeah, let's let's you know let's start changing the terminology to common bubble gather or something like that. <laughs> Um, I saw that headline was somewhere that said Obama approves sonic air guns in the Atlantic. <laughs> and the headline is true, right? But yeah. but you 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 can imagine the impact, right, on certain communities? Yeah, it was on Fox News. I think people were pretty upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, Fox will not miss an opportunity to be upset with Obama, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I, am a, I am a big advocate of um, close examination of the common shot gather. The field profile, the field record section, the FFID, you know, common FFID. That is the physical experiment, OK? Um, all right, there's other, you know, we can look at time slices. We can look at time slices, constant T. At S, in S, G, and T, we can look at time slices in M, H, and T. Um, I don't know that a whole lot of that has been done for um, um, uh, I don't know that a whole lot of that has been done um, for pre-stack data, as as these data volumes are called. All right. So when you know when do you go, when do you use each of these different gathers? Okay. They're, they're all useful in different instances. Um, you know, the, the, the idea here is that phenomena, uh, certain kinds of noise, certain kinds of reflections, um, certain kinds of processing, you know, things that work in one gather will not work in a different kind of gather. And you can do things in one, in one kind of gather that you cannot do in another gather. 
phenomena that are invisible when the data are sorted one way, they can become obvious when the data gets sorted another way. And you know, part of the, uh, the cachet that uh, processing geophysicists can build uh, with, with uh, your company and, and with your bosses is, is the flexibility to, to you know, uh, uh, resort your data in a different way, or, or as I'll show you here, just recut it in a different way and show them what they need to see. Okay, show them that they're, they're you, could, you could just resort data and you can show them that their hypothesis is, is bunk. Or you can show them that their their big play has real potential, and they can start to see dollar signs. All right. So, um, all right. Uh, advantages of zero offset uh, gathers, uh, as we know from seven hundred six, they're easy to migrate, uh, and they're easy to interpret uh, for their uh, geologic structure. Okay, and that's because we can use the exploding reflector model. So, of course, that's why. Um, you know, 20 years of, of the development of, of seismic processing, all concentrated on the stack section. Okay, fortunately, we've gone way beyond that now. Uh, the near trace gather, of course, it's an approximate. It's an approximation to the zero offset gather. Sometimes that's the best we can get, um, and that's essentially like all the uh, data that that Graham students have collected in lakes with the uh, the chirp fish. Um, those are near trace um, sections, and uh, and they're amazing what uh, what they show about the tectonics in Western Nevada uh, and Lake Tahoe. Okay, another thing you can get out of the near trace section is near surface velocities and their variation with x. How about that? Just resort it into a near trace section, and really easy to make a lateral a shallow lateral velocity variation interpretation. Nice. All right. Constant offset gathers uh, are are similarly good for what you might call statics. You know, backing out near surface velocity variations um, and and maybe um, other effects of you know static amplitude effects. Okay. They eliminate the dependence of incidence angle. And so you know if you think that you're um, you're seeing uh, uh, a bright spot in some way in your data. Um, a good thing to do is to is to bring out a constant offset section and check it out. Okay. Um, likewise, um, you might um, you might also make uh, uh, in three D data sets you might make constant azimuth sections. Okay. Uh, because uh, you know in wide azimuth data sets you have more than one direction that your your uh, recording is done in, and um, uh, there may be static effects that are static in azimuth, just like there are static effects um, that are uh, like like AVO that are that are um, no, I'm sorry, that 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 are static in uh, there are near surface effects that are static in offset. Okay, um, far trace uh, sections uh, typically are are. A good way of recognizing deeper reflections and eliminating uh, shear waves and air waves that are contaminating uh, a lot of the uh, the section. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, one of the good ways of, of deciding how to record your data, you know, what is the maximum offset you need to record, is su such that you can achieve far trace sections for uh, for your ground conditions and for the uh, uh, the targets that you're that you're looking at. Okay, there's the common midpoint section. All right, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about the CMPs. Um, they show hyperbolic reflections. They show multiplicity at uh, depth points. However, you need to uh, to migrate them. They're the input to stacking. Okay. Uh, now, clear about. Uh, defines a Clairbot actually was was ahead of the game, uh, you know, many years ago with uh, what are now common image gathers. He said a CDP gather is a CMP gather with the normal move out correction applied. Now Clairbot's only applying the normal move out depth correction, normal move out correction. He's not applying the the dip move out correction and others. Um, 
But uh, uh, you know, you can see that his definition from t 25 years ago is uh, is a darn good place to start. Okay, there's the too far. yeah yeah. Um, there's the uh, field record, right? Which is the and this is the one I love to look at the most. It's the actual experiment in physical space, and it's worth looking at for uh, for vx. Uh, you know, lateral velocity variation. It's worth looking at for changes in reflectivity with X. Uh, it shows you the elastic effects. It shows you recording artifacts. Um, it's it's the it's the actual record of your experiment. Okay, so it's extremely valuable, and and it's the one that will show you the physics. You know, all the physics that you're not accounting for in your processing, they're in the shot gather. And and all the things that are going to screw you up, they're in the shot gather, okay, in the field record. The uh, the time slice, right? That's that's where you track the coherence and move out of events in time. Okay, so um, I'd better uh, I'd better stop here, and let's suppose we have a uh, an off end uh, survey. This is how it's uh, you know really done. We might have the the star here might be the ship with its air gun array uh, towing a, uh, a streamer. And uh, maybe we're not doing anything more complicated than bouncing reflections off the uh, a flat seabed. OK? And um, the survey, uh, let's let this survey progress in the positive x direction. So we might have a vibrator truck pushing a, uh, uh, pushing a cable. And uh, let's make the stacking diagram. So. Um, uh, I want you to be uh, very familiar with this, uh, you know, six-channel uh, uh, survey and its stacking chart um, when we meet again on Tuesday morning at ten. And um, I sent you a uh, a um, a new uh, overhead one with the uh, uh, with a sheared uh, image of the stacking chart as well. So uh, check that out. And that'll be the basis of my little example here of um, uh, you know, really what we're getting at um, with uh, processing pre-stack data.